Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Isn't that one of those restoration blogs? We try to do these every three or four months, kind of keep you up on what we're doing here at the shop. You might remember this car. This car came from Argentina. This is the Botafogo. This is the race car using the uh, World War I Fiat 12A engine, 22 liter six. We've done some modifications to it. It had the big long muffler out the back. We took those off and put stacks on it just so you could see the flames coming out. But where this, <laughs> where this car really needs help is in the braking department. It's got mechanical brakes and they're only on the rear and this thing is so powerful and fast you can't stop. So what we did was uh, we found an axle. I think it's off of Lincoln and we got that next door. We had to lengthen the axle a little bit and we're going to put disc brakes on that. Uh, we'll go over there. I'll show you that in a little bit. But first of all, let me show you this one over here. And this one over here is a car called Rabbit One. This car ran at Brooklands in 1921, lapped at 113 miles an hour. It's a 1908 Mercedes uh, chassis with a Benz uh, engine out of one of those big Graf Zeppelins. This thing is about 18.8 liters. Uh, look, at this, <laughs> look at the size of the pistons. Now, the last time uh, we did this blog, I think we had just taken the cylinders off to put new water jackets on, and those are next door. But this is going to be a fascinating car. This one will also be getting a front brake. We found an axle that will fit this, and we'll put front disc brakes on this thing just to really make it drivable. You'll be able to go back and take the brakes off and keep it original at any point. But to, to run it on the streets of LA, especially the speeds these things are capable of, you can't go with these rear wheel brakes only. So. Interesting fact, this is a Benz Mercedes, not a Mercedes Benz, because it's a Mercedes chassis with a Benz engine. But come on, we'll go next door, we'll go into the shop, I'll show you the axle we're making for that and the cylinders we're doing for this. Come on. Okay, here's the axle. <laughs> now you sharp-eyed guys might recognize this is a 29 Lincoln axle. Uh, Bernard lengthened it by putting this piece in here and did a nice job on the weld. Look at that. We cut this thing in half and then made this block out of a billet, machined it to the profile, used two inches of it, and spliced it in the middle of the axle. This way, if you ever want to go back to the original axle, you just can. Just bolt it off and put it on, and you have no brakes. But this yeah. way, we'll be able to stop. The, the problem was that the Lincoln was two inches narrower between the, the springs. Right, OK. And the Fiat is. Now, yeah. the other axle we're doing for the, for the bends, similar problem, but it only is going to need about an inch and a half. OK, cool. Well, there you go. So that'll, uh, well, of course, this whole program is so we can put disc brakes on it. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to hide the disc brakes behind metal covers. Right. So when you look at it from the outside, it doesn't It'll look like, look a, like a drum from the period, even though they didn't have front drums on the cars back in the day. Yeah. But that's pretty cool. And that's, uh, this is our hub. That's, yeah. that's just uh, the spindle that goes out here. And then this is the hub. Right. And these we had made in England. What was the name of that company? you remember? Peter's Brothers, I believe it Peter's was. Brothers? I think so. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Uh, anyway, they did a great job. Uh, Peter's Brothers, I think that's it. Uh, you can look them up on the web. If we got it wrong, well, you'll get the Peter Brothers, which could be porno actors. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> but they did a nice job. Uh, they, they made a bunch. Yeah. They did it for our Doble, and they did it for these three cars as well. They, yeah, they made them to our specifications. So. Yeah, and look at that. I mean, look at the machine work there. They just did a wonderful, wonderful job. So. The, the difference on this compared to the original one is the back side. We now have a place to bolt the disc on. Right, right. Where okay. the original axle wasn't as big and we, there was no way to, to bolt the disc onto it. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's another project that's happening. Hey, Jimmy, come on over. Here's where we are. Well, you remember the last time in August when we did one of these restoration blocks, we had one done. Now, here it is, November. We have two done. <laughs> so this engine should be done six years? No, it takes a, it takes a while to do these. It does. It does. <laughs> it does you can see. You can see this is the, these things were built when technology was expensive and labor was cheap. Now labor is expensive and technology is cheap. But there we go. But we're getting there. But like I said before, I'm glad it's not a 12 cylinder. But that gives you an update. We have two done now. And now you have the base plate here, which we didn't have done before. So right. now this one is completely finished, just a matter of hooking up. Right. These are completed, right. pressure checked, and now we're on our second okay. one. And we're done with all of our tooling, too. Right. So that's why they're going to move along a little quicker now. The next one took me probably half to a third amount of yeah. time to make because I didn't have to make the tooling. 
So now that we're moving right along, everything's pre-made. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting each one finished. Uh, the hardest part really is the preparation of them because cutting the sheet metal off the original cylinders, we got to be careful not to cut into the original cast iron. Right, right. We've got to save all these threaded areas in the valve. So, you know, you just have something you can just bust into. You're not going to do this during a pit stop, okay? Just no, forget that. It's going to take so. a little while. All right. But well, we'll cool. have it done for you. Well, well, I'm done soon. Yeah. As you probably remember, the last time we were working on a Bruff Superior motorcycle, that one there, I'll show you that in a second. Uh, this one is another Bruff. Nice, original old bike, not too messed with, 1924. This is the SS, this is the, uh, well, for lack of a better word, non-overhead valve engine. Uh, this is the flathead engine, I guess you'd call it. SS80, this was the fastest Bruff Superior until the SS100 came out. Uh, oil pump was all broken inside, so got a couple on order, we're trying to find some parts. But the nice thing about this motor is, look, Nothing is rounded off. Nobody went through this with a wrench and over tightened everything. This bike is just a nice, good old girl. And that's, that's kind of the cool thing. It's not worn out. It's free. Look at that. Plugs are out of it, obviously. Everything moves on it, okay. Everything worked. Nothing bent, nothing dented. So I'm probably just going to keep it the way it is and just get it running. It hasn't run in. 45 years, 48 years, I think 1969 or something was the last time it ran. And so that's where we are with that one. Meanwhile, this one here, this is the one that drove us crazy. We went through three sets of pistons with this thing. Uh, George, how you doing? Let's show George, grab the piston, show him how they scored. I think one of the most beautiful bikes ever made, if not the most beautiful bike. This is a 1930 SS100, it's 50 horsepower. It weighs eh, just a shade over 400, maybe. Uh, but it has what they call a total loss system. Uh, the oil does not circulate. It just, and you, you adjust it by turning this here. How many drips per minute? When we first got it, it just blew smoke out all over the place. So let's restrict the oil. Well, we did restrict the oil, and uh, you can see what happened here. Well, that's an original piston. That's the original piston. So that had an issue. Yeah. It was taken apart in the past, put back in. Right. These pistons, um, Bernard found somebody that had um, See, forged I've, pistons. It scored. But the clearance was too tight. So these cylinders got sleeved with about three thousandths running clearance. That was too tight. Yeah, should and, be what, uh, eight thousandths? Six, six to, or eight. Six to eight. Um, and then when the test rider was out riding it, um, it got tight. Yeah, it got so, tight on me. There you go. So and, now we've got the nice clearance. And at the time we put it together, we left off the oil ring. Right. Okay, so because the idea being this thing just sort of splashes and throws oil everywhere. But what we did was we put it back together again. We put three rings in it this time. We put an oil ring in it, but we just opened up the clearances a little bit. And now this thing runs so good. I mean, it runs like, not like a modern bike, but boy, it feels like a modern bike. It feels like a Vincent from the 50s or something. 50 horsepower, 400 pounds, hand shift. It's just the best riding bike. It is a lot of fun. I mean, we went through a couple of sets of these to figure out how to get this thing right, but now we got it, and that's uh, Yeah, and the that's real issue cool. with the three-piece oil ring, you're gonna have so much ring tension that the piston's gonna create so much friction and heat, and yeah. then it'll seize. So the ring that we have here is not really an oil distribution ring, it's a scraper ring. Yeah. And if you run this engine through with the spark plugs out, you'll see oil above the piston, so it's getting oil. Yeah. And the the tension when you put the piston in the cylinder and pull it out isn't so great that it's going to overheat yeah. like yeah. like the Ace did. And, and when you burn oil like this, that's why you carry extra spark plugs. T. E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, had uh, seven of these. He bought eight, but he died before he got the eighth one. But he went through 76 spark plugs in, <laughs> in a year. And you should just, because, you know, you could set a light, doom, 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 plug it oil up, pull over, change the plugs. But yeah. we got it fixed now. I've got about, probably just about 500 miles on it now. So it's running good, and uh, it is the most rewarding bike to drive. It's really, really a lot of fun. But come on, let's get back to the cars, and we'll show you where we are with the Cunningham. This is our Cunningham. We've been restoring for quite a while now. Pear has done a wonderful job, and uh, Pear, come on in. All right. You know, painting is probably one of the most frustrating things because it's just, there's so many things out of your control with getting it right. Now, you did the roof again, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. What happened? What happened? I got some uh, fish eyes, we call it, yeah. silicone. 
yeah. spot. It's like a, you go down to the prime. Yes, that's silicone. Can't say fish eye anymore because that's an anti fish slur. Oh, I so see. So you hear okay. from the so fish people. So you have to say uh, silicone. Silicone. Silicone spot. Yeah, you can't okay. say fish eye anymore. And I tried to rub it out, but then yeah. you go too deep, so you yeah. end it into the, the primer, and then you have to start over again and paint it, you know? And so. modern paint. Especially in California, it all has to be water-based now, right? If for the most time, yeah, they, yeah. But single stage, we can get it reg regular. Yeah, yeah. But as soon as it's two stage, I mean, with the uh, metallic, yeah, you gotta have a uh, waterborne. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There was discussion on whether we wanted to leave the steering wheel, sort of. Uh, patina. Yeah, patina. Yeah, the the wood was kind of cracking, but then we figured, nah. We kept all the original wood, and it's all, yeah. all we did was oh, yeah. fix it, so there we go. And of course, the big Hemi engine. Uh, you know, Briggs Cunningham built these cars in West Palm Beach, Florida. The body's by Vignali. He was uh, the Italian coach builder. Ferrari used the exact same body. And in 1952, what would you rather have? A little two and a half or three, three liter Ferrari engine? Or a big Chrysler Hemi with two four barrels on it. It's, you know, the Ferrari didn't have the name back in the early 50s. I mean, they were gaining the name, yeah. but it, it, it wasn't the prestigious name it is now. It's just an obscure Italian car maker. This is the engine that came with the car. It's, a, it's the two four barrel setup that came with the car. We've converted this to 12 volts. This was a six volt system. You gotta have 12 volts just to get the lights to work and whatnot. But everything else is pretty stock. And, these are hard to restore because the fenders are welded to the body, exactly. right? Yeah, so... Steel and alu aluminum. Yeah, yeah, so... But, uh, yeah, it's coming along. It takes a long time to get these right, so... Yeah. Very good. And we made new glass, too, didn't we? Yeah, we had new glass, yeah. front the rear. Yeah, yeah. So. Side glass, everything. Yeah. Come on, let's show you some more stuff. This is upholstery shop section uh, of the garage. This is the seat to the uh, Cunningham. As you can see, bucket seats hadn't really come into their own in the early 50s. This is the stock seat, just a big sort of bench seat, and you had your, your armrest here to kind of keep it from sliding around. And there's the Mercedes seats uh, over there that I talked about. Take a look. And these are the seats for that 3.5 coupe. That's the headliner. As you can see, this nice, thick German leather, which I really, really like. You know, I like the kind, in modern stuff, you can't really put the hide food in it because it's all sealed, it doesn't breathe at all. But these seats are really, really fantastic. We've, we found some of the original leather and we redid them all. But when we take that for a road test and get it all finished, we'll give you more of an update on it, but just to show you what we've been doing. Now, some stuff's been neglected. Uh, we haven't done much with our 1914 Detroit Electric. We were going gangbusters on that for a while. And then we just sort of stopped to get another project. So, uh, that's sitting over there in the corner. We'll get on that again real soon. We're real, really close, just have to put the uh, electric motor in and hook up the batteries and uh, we're almost done there. As I mentioned a million times on this website, when I was in college, I used to work for Mercedes-Benz in Boston. I used to love these 71 3.5 coupes. And I found this one in Vegas, one owner car, and uh, never been hit, never been damaged, but the problem was it was Vegas, so everything just sort of dried out and the paint cracked and all the rubber seals. What is that? What are we hearing over there? That's the wind. Oh, the wind, yeah. Yeah, yeah taking yeah. out the, the flare. Anyway, so. but it's, it's coming back very nicely. It's uh, coming. Yeah, it looks great. We painted it in the original color, redoing the wood, redoing the leather. And uh, these are just wonderful driving cars. This is always one of my favorite Mercedes. Right after the 6.3 came the 3.5 coupe. These were the last of the hand-built or coach-built Mercedes-Benz cars with the real rich Mercedes leather, you know, that real thick leather. Oh, yeah. When you get in, it's got that aroma to it. The modern stuff, eh, not so much. But this, this one's pretty cool, so. It is made a solid build if you look at the door. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a cast unit, the whole door. Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. look here, that's a cast piece. Yeah. And then they wrap the, the panel outside. It's amazing. Sunroof, solid, wonderful car. Yep. Let's see what Jim Hall is up to. He's got his uh, Lotus Cortina and the Rolls Royce Merlin he's working on. Let's check that out. Jim Hall is in diligently working on our 27 liter Rolls Royce with the Merlin engine in it. What do you got there? Oh, the uh, water. Uh... Well, these are these are vent tubes. So right. these are printed parts. These right, are 3D right. D printed parts. Uh, they're now all painted, ready to go on. They get fitted into here. Uh, Hard to see down in here, but there's a part that we couldn't have made almost any other way than printing. Yeah. 
Uh, fuel lines are all done. These fittings are all plated and set to go. I believe this is the only Merlin engine in the world running on Weber carburetors, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Because we had to make our own manifold using a 3D printer. Anyway, it, it's actually getting pretty doggone close to where we could start it. So yeah, the other yeah. thing over there, I'm, I'm working on the instrument panel, which... Uh, Come on, we'll show you the instrument panel. Come around here. Here's the dashboard for the uh, Rolls-Royce, as you can see. So this is the engine turn one that we did here right. in, in the shop. That's all wired up, ready to go. And we had our friends at Madeira Concepts up in Santa Barbara do some, uh, was it Carpathian Elm? Uh, Carpathian Burl. Elm Burl. You know, uh, Madeira Concept, if you've got an old Rolls or a Jaguar, or any, preferably usually English car that has, you know, that beautiful wood in it, it's all coming apart, the lamination's peeling, they can redo it and make it just look beautiful. That's what they did for us here. We got a piece. Boy, they do a nice job. And that, this here will go around the perimeter of the dashboard, sorry. Yeah, you know, it's a, but it's kind of jewelry for the dashboard. Yeah, yes, yeah. You know, it's a Rolls Royce. It needs to have a little of this yeah. classic wood. As part it's a of real Rolls chassis with a body we built here at the shop. I've told you that before. And uh, a real Rolls engine. So there you go. And you had to buy another uh, engine to go with it, yeah. right? Yeah, we have another Merlin. <laughs> You're going to see that in a couple of weeks. This, of course, is that fire engine that blew up on us. That's a valve, son. Look at that. And there's a gear. Look at that. And this is the bottom end, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's the main bearing. That's what you call a roller bearing crank, ladies and gentlemen. A roller bearing for the crank. I mean, look at that thing. Jesus. Uh. Now, of course, Jim's own project, the one he's been working on, uh, the Lotus Cortina, people seem really fascinated by that one. Because that was really just the car. For those of us a certain generation, that was the car Jim Clark made his name in. And, oh, it was just a wonderful car. And Jim found one year, so what, 66, 65? 66. 66, yeah. And he's putting it back to exactly 100% original. Come on, I'll show you. This is Jim's Lotus. As you see, he's done a meticulous job on the paint and bodywork. The hardest part was trying to find the right green. I mean, the first green you had looked like John Deere green. Every Lotus I've seen, the green is just a little bit different. Well, and nobody actually knows the true color or what the paint coat is. Yeah. I've, I spent hours researching. I finally found a friend of mine our friend Todd Gerstenberger had a can left over oh. from 1968 of original paint. Yeah. We sprayed that out and had it matched. So this is the yeah. thing. You know, it's so funny. It's not a shade of green I would ever call attractive or I would like, but it looks perfect on the car because this is not really white. This is like a cream and this is not really green. It's different, but it looks perfect and it looks really authentic and it makes it look like the race car, you know? Yeah, it, it's... Uh, I didn't really care for this green, and so I didn't want to paint it that green. Yeah. But once we got it on the car, and you see it, everything buffed out, polished. It's like, okay, this is it's right. Yeah, it really comes together. It doesn't look like some, uh, like a modern, you know. I, I, I don't remember greens really jumping out on me until at least the 70s when, when the Lamborghinis had those lurid greens and, and the Chrysler, you know, the crazy plum colors and all that. Kind of. So this is what it looked like, and now it really looks authentic and across the flat black dashboard or is that gloss black well it's a semi-gloss semi yeah um but i'm starting to actually put stuff back together yeah. notice we have a manual here so yeah and look at this i mean this is what a beautiful job he's done here this is a pretty rust free car wasn't it it was it was really good but it was also i had a full year yeah just in doing the metal work in this car yeah. but as lotuses go it was pretty good yeah because people don't I mean, realize these were yeah. cheap cars. they were um, cheap cars and metal was disposable. I mean, yeah. a year or two of, of rain and the thing would rust out. And you got your Lotus badge on. That really makes it. Well, and, and the guys that are helping me with the paint, he did just a fabulous job on this yeah. car. You know, it's like, can I put the badge on now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, now you can put the badge on. So. And the cool thing is, it's a real Lotus. You know, there are a lot of guys do Lotus replicas or look-alike, but this is one of the real Lotus cars, which makes it really cool. You can go to the, get all the factory numbers and everything matches up, and it's, it's really exciting, very cool. Well, yeah. I wanted to say, you know, thank you for letting me do this. Oh, no, this is great. This is great. It's fun. It's fun. Dream.
Cool. So, well, that's pretty much our restoration blog for this month. And uh, stay tuned, and we'll be back next week with more uh, cars and motorcycles. Mm-hmm. <laughs>